Welcome to Politics Done Right. I am your host, Egberto Willis. This is a progressive program that will take the mystery out of politics. This is the program that will encourage you to make sure government becomes we the people. Whether you are liberal, progressive, conservative, or otherwise, you get to hear your point of view. We are an independent media outlet that, unlike mainstream media beholden to corporations, we only owe allegiance to you. Remember, you can also send me a tweet at E-G-B-E-R-T-O-W-I-L-L-I-E-S. That is at Egberto Willis. Let us engage. It is Politics Done Right. Welcome to Politics Done Right. My name is Egberto Willis, your host. Good morning, Houston. Good morning, Harris County. Good morning to the great state of Texas. Good morning to Northeast Texas, Southeast Texas, Northwest Louisiana, Southwest Louisiana, and every nook and cranny receiving a piece of that 100,000 watt transmitter signal coming in from Houston. Good morning to the rest of the world who receives or signals via the internet. That magical thing created by we the people, the internet created by we the people, not Elon Musk, not Bill Gates, not any one of these folks. We the people create, laid the foundations. We the people sent somebody to the moon. We the people invested in all the technological advances that then was used as the base by our large and important private sector to bring things to fruition. But then the private sector, many sections of the private sector in its utter selfishness thought that they owned it all and they took all the spoils to create billionaires. Remember folks, nobody has earned a billion. Nobody. I know people love to buy the narrative. Nobody has earned a billion. And there are a lot of people out there working their butts off, get up and watch that freeway, working their butt off, butts off, so that those billionaires can have what they have, a piece of all our actions, and then cry when somebody tells them, your taxes are due. But that's not the show today. That's just me blowing a few bits off after reading a few articles. But, but, but let's get to the studio where the real action is with the geniuses that runs it all. Hey guys, how you doing this morning? I was just checking to see if Jack has a bite. He's worked it off. Ooh. Yeah, he's sitting there on his backbone. It's like, okay, Jack, where's your seating space? Well, I earned a billion dollars. I just never got it. I know, you know, you're worth <laughs> yeah. Hey, you know what I always say, right? A lot of folks sit down there and they scratch about money. Well, we know you're not scratching about money, but there are a lot of folks that are scratching about money and what they can do or whatever. And these are very productive folks, right? But somehow Mm -hmm. they don't get their part of the action because there are those who know how to monopolize, use our capitalist system to monopolize on your worth. Anyway, that's my spiel. Yeah, I know. The whole whole dadgum world is... Yeah, it's full of those greed mongers. Yes. And I have nothing else to say. But, <laughs> but, but Jack, Jack has does. Some, yeah, he's got he's got almost uh, a third, no, over half a page of wisdom for us this morning. Well, before he starts, I want to welcome to say a great good morning. Yesterday was scary. That's what Melanie Keelan from Barcelona, Spain says. We'll talk. Hey, Melanie, what are you scared about? Anyway, come on in, Jack. Uh, good morning, Egberto. Good I'm morning, my brother. Now. All right. You know, we have we have another looming problem that's not getting much mention in the news or much of any place anyway, and that's our corrupted Supreme Court. Oh, yeah. The citizens of the United States of America are dead in the water because of the corrupted, out-of-balance conservative Supreme Court that protects greedy corporate interests over the rights of the citizens. We are living in an era where the corporate wants to have dominion over the function of government, cloak themselves with the flag, and pilfer the citizenry with taxes, big health care, low wages, and war. VP Kamala Harris must have a plan to balance the court. Unstack it or pack it. 
protect the citizens from corporate rule. I, that leads me to something else. I, I wasn't going to say much about this, but I'm in an argument with a former colleague about uh, the Trump administration. He was telling me, oh, things were so much better under Trump. I said, okay, well, why don't you do this? Look at your children and your grandchildren. Look in their eyes. And I have four granddaughters who are coming of age right now. The oldest just graduated from high school, and there's three behind her that are coming of age and going to be teenagers. I said, okay, look in, their, look in their eyes. And when they ask you, how did you vote? Well, honey, I voted for the man who said it was okay to grab women by their privates. I voted for a man who uh, abused and abused women. And I voted for a man who uh, appointed despicable judges who took your rights away to control your own body. And they'll say, Grandpa, why did you do that? Don't we matter? Well, you know, I had more money in the bank under Trump, so it was okay. Well, what about us? Don't you care about us? What, what kind of a future is that? Well, honey, it's, it's, it's all that matters is you have more money in the bank. It doesn't make any difference whether you have any rights. I just had more money in the bank, so I had to vote for this man. But Grandpa, he's a liar, a crook, a thief. Yeah, but, but I had more money in the bank. It's okay. So what do I tell them? Whoa. What do I tell them? That, why did you vote for a man like that? Oh, well, I just had more money in the bank. The economy was so much better. Everything was cheaper. It doesn't make any difference that, you know, he has no morals. He has no moral compass. He is uh, almost Satan incarnate, almost, but not quite. Doesn't matter. As long as you got money in the bank, well, you know, you're good. They've taken all your rights. Oh, I got money in the bank for now. So what do you, you know, tell your children you when, know, when um, you look at them and they ask you that question? What do you say? You better practice and practice now. You know, the personalization that you just gave there, Howard, is impeccable and necessary. It is a similar phrase, but you said it so beautifully. It's a similar thing that I've been using every day at three o'clock on my show, where I tell folks, how do you speak to your kids? How do you also tell your son that he must respect women? When you vote for somebody like Donald Trump, how do you tell your son not to sexually assault women when you voted for Donald Trump and said it's OK? You as the daddy said it was OK. And you said something right there um, that the following. You said, how do you tell your daughter that the reason you did that is because you had more money in the bank? The truth of the matter is that part isn't even true anymore. The only reason in the beginning they had more money in the bank is we had this thing called a pandemic. That brother Trump uh, made a lot worse than it should have. Oh, he ex, 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 botched it. And that's the reason folks were suffering. But then after the stimuli and everything else came, what was wonderful is that even what you just said there is no longer the fact for most Americans. Their 401ks have exploded, much more so than under Donald Trump. Yesterday, I wrote a piece uh, on, uh, uh, in fact, it was based on a call. I'm coming to you, John, but I want to get this out. It was based on a caller who called us yesterday where, you know, uh, where she gave the reasons why she thought she supported Donald Trump. The one that blew my mind the most was when she said he's a Christian. Right. And uh, th that blew my mind in that uh, evangelicals are one of his largest supporters. They are supporting somebody that is diametrically opposed to everything Jesus Christ stood for. He's done exactly the things Jesus Christ has told you and not did. It's not that he did these things. It's that he continues to do these things that Jesus Christ opposes. So it, it always behooves me when a Christian tells me, including some of my family members that are evangelical Christians. It's a particular type of Christian that supports Donald Trump. And it's because of how they were brain teased, brainwashed into thinking that God sends people in different modals to do the work. And sometimes they sense flawed people. Well, why the hell would God send a flawed person when it'll be much more difficult for people to believe that some flawed person does the work of Jesus Christ? But the things that she said, things like the economy was better, et cetera, and that they were doing better. The only thing that made sense, the, the only thing that they can say is under the Biden administration, inflation was higher. And the thing about that is that in the answer that I gave to her in a, a blog piece that I wrote, I pointed out that one, forget what the CNBC is telling you, 100% of inflation 
was caused by corporate greed. And I pointed out the oil, how the oil prices were done. I pointed out how the product prices change, et cetera, to prove the point, how offshoring caused the outsourcing, for, I mean, the uh, supply chain problem. So all these things were laid out. And, you know, it wasn't subjective. It was objective. But you made the point about some people believing their financial well-being was better. And here we have one of our uh, very conservative listeners says, but sadly, even after what you've said about humanity, uh, about humanity, uh, Howard, even the human question that you had with your granddaughters, that you, the hypothetical you spoke about with your granddaughters, we have somebody that after listening to that says, but sadly, you will, you will let your grandchildren pay for stuff we can't afford as a country bust up monopoly. Currently, the money is going to, I mean, it, it completely disregard the humanity of what you said. This is Eric Hayes. Eric, I'm disappointed in your response. But the, the, the disregard for the humanity that you just spoke about, Howard, is what is so disconcerting with the people who support Donald Trump. The lack of humanity in those statements. But anyhow, let's go to Brother John. He, he usurped. Brother John is going to come in before I start the program. Come on in, Brother John. Talk to me. Inverto, well, I, I called today because I had to say something about the media. I, I watch I watch TV and the different news programs, and I pay attention to all these uh, web places like the BBC and Guardian Hill, you know, all these uh, news agencies. And what I find is I don't think they take it serious that right now we're not just fighting for our freedom, our Constitution. It includes them. It includes the media and how they word things and how they say things matters. And I heard Obama say that a few years ago, that words matter. And one of the things that I read that it made me feel better was that Joe Biden continues to try to tell his people, quit using the word abortion. Use the word. He wants to use the word choice. Personally, I think it's health care uh, and it's right, women's rights that they should be pushing, which historically has been a bad issue because it doesn't get the Republicans moving because they do not have a conscience. And I have a person, just like most of y'all do, that you try to convince women, a woman with master's degree and you can't understand why she backs Trump. And I think all the words that are being used and uh, when they bring up the bumper, and I heard a woman yesterday speak uh, brilliantly about what they, how they should say things and what they should approach and how the border is really not an issue the Democrats should shy away from uh, simply because I still think they don't approach it correctly. They, they, they think the problem is at the Texas border and the problem is at the Guatemalan border right. and how all people come all the way through Mexico and they're allowed to do that. Well, if you read the article a couple of days ago about El Chapo's son turning in El Chapo's old partner and now... The Mexican government is filing a lawsuit against the United States government because of that. And you think, why is the president of Mexico concerned with the fact that the United States now has uh, this guy? Why are they concerned? And it tells me that what I thought all along is the cartel owns the Mexican government. They have them in their pocket somewhere. Because why do you allow these people to travel the distance of a whole country and then let the United States and the United States, not one Republican has ever talked about, hey, we need to talk to the U.S. to the Mexican government, don't we? And so the words that you use when you're talking about that matters. And I I don't hear them talking about the attack on education. And it hits home. I, I got two. My, my, my oldest son and, and his wife are teachers. And I got, still have two young kids, one 17 years old and one 12 years old in school here in Cypress Fairbanks and schools are being attacked and I don't hear the media fighting about it uh, daily. They just do not argue it. They do not come up with that point that the state of Texas is keeping funding from the schools while these schools go broke. It just doesn't make sense. So what's said in the media matters with the words that they use, how they approach the women's health care. And, and the rights that they don't have. And that's going to happen if you allow it. And and the media doesn't seem to think that maybe their jobs are not at stake here because they, according to 2025, there will be no, there'll be state-run media. It won't be like you see it now. And I think people don't believe that that could possibly happen. You what know, you uh, uh, first of all, what you said is genius. I, I, I want, I, 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 you hit the core of the problem. 
one of the reasons I do this and one of the reasons you see me speak to everybody, MAGA, left wing, right wing and everything else is for the same reason that you've said perfectly. The media gives the wrong narrative. The, re- the media doesn't go down and try to listen to people, try to talk to people, see where people's heads are, see why people's heads are where their heads are. In other words, you have to try to figure out, uh, and, and these are different, different, what the, what the right and the, our oligarchy has done, have done very well. It's, you know, you know, the, the big thing about it is we talk a lot about identity politics and we should be dealing with identity politics. But you know who does? The people who are trying to convince uh, people to vote against their own interests. And you know how they do it? They know the push points for different identities, right? They know the problems that different right. communities have. So the way they, they promote a story on, uh, like, if you see Trump doing it very well. The way he, uh, that black jobs thing that everybody is really saying, oh, Donald Trump is racist for talking about black jobs. And the media is carrying it just like you said, but they're not explaining it, right? Yeah, the black job stuff sounds no, racist, no. but it wakes up a lot of black people to say, is there something to what Donald Trump is saying? Ah, and then they then tie it to, well, Donald Trump is saying that these uh, people coming over the border are taking my job. But you know how Donald Trump jarred them into thinking about it? By saying black job. If he said, uh, you know, these, these, uh, for, these foreigners are coming into our country to take over the jobs of Americans, nobody would hear it. But you jar it. You say something that jars somebody. You say something racist. You, you know, I, I, let me tell you something that I've learned. And I, I, I hate to take it here, but this is what I've learned, right? People can call me anything, right? The N word, the, 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 the H word. They can call me anything. And my tonality and everything stays the same because I've neutralized myself from being jarred. But if I want to disrupt, let's say I, I go into a community or, or I go into a party and I want to disrupt that party. And let's say there are a whole lot of, let's say, black people there. I said, all you N people. And that would immediately stop everything. And people would start to react, right? That is what the right knows how to do. And they do it with with race. They do it with gender. They do it with transgender. And everybody starts to react and they forget about all the things that really matter. Right. And that's what they're good at. And that is what the old media is terrible at. They they allow Donald Trump and others to create the storyline of the day that let mothers forget their daughters and their, their babies don't have Similac because of the policies of the right. They allow Donald Trump to say or, or, or anybody to say certain things that let, the, that let the manufacturing of all our products overseas oh. go unnoticed. So you nailed it with narrative use, matter. Well, they use old-fashioned propaganda that's very simple. I, right. I'm, I'm not going to say that Christie's fat. I'm mm-hmm. just not going to say that he's fat, that he's obese. And guess what? You just said it. Right. But right. You're saying you say that. I said that I wasn't saying it. And, and that's all an anarchist and a person who's trying to chaos. That's all he has to do. Right. And if you don't take that directly and corrupt it as the media, which is I depend on the media. Do, do you not? Do you not depend on the free press? I do. Yes. Yes. And if, so if you tell me if you tell me a lie. That's not knowledge. You're not giving me power because power, knowledge is power. But if you tell me a lie, you're not giving me power. And, and I need to realize that. Well, sometimes the media needs to tell people that, that, hey, you know what? He just said Chris Christie was fat. Yeah. And, I, I, and, and tell them the truth. That's the same no. thing with the woman. I don't understand. Well, I mean, that's the power of, you know, one of the reasons the right. And I'm coming to you in a minute, Ray. One of the reasons the right goes to evangelicals and one of the reasons even America like dictatorships, right, is that you have the minds of a whole lot of people all at once. Right. So if I if I bring a whole yeah. bunch of evangelical preachers into the fold and I pay off all these evangelical preachers and I make them feel important now. So you have Bill, uh, Bill Graham's son is a part of the Trump team and you have all these evangelicals a part of the Trump team. They feel the taste of power. All right. Yeah, now all they yeah, have to do. Thank you right. for listening. Anyway. Right now, uh, now the, you, you have all these people of power, these evangelicals of power. They, they get power now. 
the way the church works is a church teaches that there's a pastor who moves his flock. So once I own that pastor, I own the vast majority of his flock. And that's why you see a lot of evangelicals are so towing the line for Donald Trump, because their pastors have given them a way to support a guy that is an if that is being is antithetical to Christianity to Jesus Christ. But anyway, let's go ahead and bring in Ray from South Park, my dear brother Ray. How are you doing, sir? Have you brought up pastor? Can you hear me? Yes, sir, I can. Okay. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up the pastor because you know, I was just sifting through some documentaries uh here on YouTube and I was trying to figure out what is the plight of Black MAGA, you know? And one of the things that I saw was an interview with that black pastor mm-hmm. who allowed Trump to take over his church. Mm-hmm. And this black pastor, you know, he kind of reminded me, he, he gave me the vibes of a black Joel Osteen, you know, very charismatic, big, wide smile, very happy-go-lucky. And when he talks about Trump, you know, he's like, he, he, he starts to go through these mental gymnastics of why it's okay to allow a 34 felon person into your church, why it's okay to let a, a, a convicted and, and adjudicated rapist into your church. Why? Because, like you said, he gives him access to power. When right. Trump called him on that phone and says, hey, I want to come to your church that man felt powerful. Then it really dawned on me, what is this man's background? This man was a former street pharmacist, which tells me he had a background. He had a past that was checkered. He had trouble coming up in this world. And you know what he came and what he got out of that? What he got out of that was that the government was ineffective. It failed him. And all he needed to do was pull himself up by his bootstraps and and make something out of himself, so he became a shiesty priest, a, a, a shiesty pastor who allows grifters like Donald Trump to take over his church. And what that basically said, and I'm gonna bring the point home, is that unfortunately, what I'm seeing and hearing in the black conservative MAGA world is that there might just be a lot of grifters, unfortunately, because in the black in the black society, we have to hustle to survive. So Trump is basically exploiting a talent that a lot of black people had to learn just for survival, which is grifting, which I, f- I consider being an, an, a valid, an evangelical preacher as a form of grifting because you're standing there telling people how to live their lives and you're just raking in money in your little collection plate. And I wish that, you know, black conservatives would get off of that whole individualism thing you know it's between me and god and that's the only way i'm gonna ever have a good life the government can't do anything for me except tell me you know what to do and and how to kill my baby and a lot of things like that i, I could go down a rabbit hole but i'm gonna cut it off right there at let me, Ray, let me just tell you that i i you, you nailed it right but i i want to give a little bit of grace to uh black people in this regard. Um, There is Trump and most of the evangelical movement, the part that support Trump, the black part that support Trump is in fact a minority, while the evangelical movement in the white domain is a majority. So um, I want to give in this case a little bit of grace for one specific reason, right? Um, there is something that, uh, uh, what's the name of the comedian? Uh, God, uh, 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 he always talk about, uh, uh, Chris Rock. Chris Rock said something one time that really touched me. Right. And he said he was on stage and he said, I just want to be able to be a black guy who fails. And what he meant by that was that there are a lot of failed, let's say white dentists or whatever. And it's not the end of the world for them. And it, when it comes to, uh, to how others judge in general, let's say people of color, et cetera, they get the, they get the option to fail once. I mean, they're, they're exception to the rule, et cetera. I, 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 I say that 
to kind of move that into saying that it's while the evangelical movement is really into Trump, we have Reverend Barber, who is also a part of the evangelical movement. And Reverend Barber, along with a whole bunch of white pastors, have this stuff that created this organization called the Poor People's Campaign. And uh, I forgot the other one that he told me about that are out there really trying to cut, trying to inoculate from what these shysters are doing, both of, of all types. And I think it's important for us to, to kind of see that as well. But what you said, you nailed it. That shyster that brought Donald Trump into his church, uh, I mean, it's nothing more than the house you know what that, we've, that many have spoken about back in the days of slavery, right? Why did slavery last as long as it did? Because those who knew better or those who could have helped solve the problem didn't. Give me a closer, Ray. Yeah, well, I mean, basically you said it. And and, I, and shout out to, to pastors like William Barber. You know, I know that there are, you know, good Christ-based, faith-based organizations that are like the Poor People's Campaign and actually teach the word of Jesus. But I'm oh, just yeah. saying it, so, you know, uh, as a black person, you know, and, and speaking to people in their community, it, it really saddens me that we've been brainwashed into this individualistic thought that we can't do anything collectively because the government will never listen to us. And right. I'll leave on. That. Good. Hey, and thanks for that message, because it's, it's a message that when we get together collectively, all of us, when we get collectively, all of us. We can. Thank you for that, Ray. Let's go to Art. Come on in, Art. Brother Art, you're on. Good morning. Thanks. Good morning. Thank you for taking my call. And I always have another second thing to say when I'm on hold. Uh, that the the Christian pastors a little history back uh, right after 9/11. I think it was George Bush. He started the faith yes. faith initiative. Um, what I know, then you can do your own research. Everyone could. Uh, you started seeing more churches, mosques, and synagogues putting American flags in their churches, which was not very uh, kosher at the time because you're supposed to separate church from state. Why would you put an American flag, Texas flag, Panamanian flag, so any flag in a church when you're supposed to have only a church, uh, a flag for your God of whatever institution you belong to? But what I did find out also is that if they put that flag up, it's usually because it took federal funds. And once you take funds from anybody, the mafia, the left, the right, the government, in this situation, then you kind of got to stick to certain uh, pronouns, certain subjects, certain language. And um, so, yeah, if you visit a church and you see an American flag, they're taking federal funding. So or a mosque or a synagogue, to be fair, across all this. Anyway, Didn't know that. my point is, is uh, the best turn. It looks like they picked another lifetime politician to be uh, to take um, over Sheila Jackson Lee's position. I was hoping it'd be Amanda Edwards. And I looked it up on Click to Houston. You know how they can have some misconceived numbers. But she came in second. And I'm hoping she, uh, you know, she fights it and comes in because I, I like, you know, we need more youth in there. I mean, not that like in her teens or 20s, but I mean, we just need younger blood in there. And so best to turn to take, you know, that spot or be chosen to be taking that spot. Uh, from my understanding, he's just going to finish the term, right? I mean, you probably know more about this. No, well, well, actually, there's a new term. He's uh, uh, it's, uh, his her daughter is supposed to finish the last two, three weeks of her term or something like that, right. which is all she's going yeah, to get. And then uh, the the person that the precinct chairs pick, which was Sylvester Turner, would go and look. Uh, I have nothing against Sylvester Turner, but my God, why can't these old either, why, why can't these old politicians yeah, exactly. just say let's let the youth take over? And I, I just it's I think it's a power thing about, you know, that's a uh, Sheila Jackson's position as a how as a rep is a very powerful position. And it's going to be interesting because Sylvester and our current mayor doesn't have a good working relationship. And the mayor is going to now want to lean on uh, on Sylvester. I mean, I just think it's an all around disaster that we did. Let, there were so many young, younger uh, people running that had new ideas that could have been placed there. And I just think, uh, you know, it's a lousy thing. And I, I'll say it. And look, I, like I said, I like Sylvester and I'll, I see Sylvester at all different things that I go to and I go talk to him, etc. But I mean, look, I, I, I am a political guy and one, and there are times I would love to say, you know what, maybe I should run for X, Y, Z. And the truth of the matter is, I said, no, it's let's let the younger people, let's, it's a millennials time. You know what I mean? 
It's time for the millennials to take over. It's that simple. Time for the millennials to take over. And, yeah, and I think Amanda had, Edwards had it, you know, when it was just her running when Sheila Jackson Lee was trying to get the mayor's position. But once that didn't fan out, and, you know, respectfully, thankfully that didn't happen because she would have died in office. She went ahead and just kind of, I think it was a political backstab to Amanda Edwards because then she had to take over, you know, her spot, her, her, uh, Sheila Jackson had to take her spot back, and Amanda Edwards didn't win. So that that was wrong then, and I, you know, sorry that happened yeah. to her. Man. But I really hope you know something happens to where we can get rid of these life. And no matter how good they are, just being in there over fifteen. 10 years. Brother, look, I, I'm with you, Art. I mean, I don't know. I saw on all sides. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I, I would have loved to see Edwards or either Edwards or Plummer, right? Plummer is, uh, I know Plummer's dad. And uh, these are people that worked in the community for a very, very long time. You know, these are good people. Uh, now, let me just say something else. You know, I mean, and this goes for, for Trump. This goes for Biden. I saw Biden yesterday at an event, right? And I'll have to be honest. I think Nancy Pelosi is about 80-something years as, as well. And she was instrumental in, in convincing Biden to, uh, to, you know, not to run again. But I saw Biden yesterday talking at, a, at, a, at an event. And the only thing that could come to my mind is like, wow, Democrats got a break. That's all I could say. Democrats got a break. Because everybody who has eyes and feelings or whatever had to have seen him. And he's a good guy. He did great things. He brought us back. He saved the democracy, all that good stuff. But my God, uh, he's tired and uh, he he's not aging very well. And uh, I, I am just glad that uh, we had somebody. And again, it's an older person as well. Nancy Pelosi, who I think also has to have a bench. You know, but it's good to see that this has happened. But anyway, Art, anything else before I move on? No, everyone be safe. Thank you for your time. Thank you so kindly, Art. Anyway, folks, uh, I see another call and I'll wait for uh, Jack to kind of uh, put something up on that one. But in, in the interim, today's show, again, you guys control what's going to happen. If you start calling in the beginning, we're going to take the calls and see where you want to take it. But the, the show is titled The Following. Uh, uh, alarm, equity firms and doctors group, Republicans see the light, and Todd misses point on Trump. And specifically, Marky Warren sound alarm over private equity firms deal, deal to buy doctors group. Selling Massachusetts doctors to another private equity firm could be a disaster, said Senator Elizabeth Warren. This is a very important story. And if you look around Houston, you're going to see a whole lot of private doctor practices coming up. And I'm coming to you, Joni. Give me about uh, one minute to kind of frame this, and then I'll come to you, and then I'll finish this afterwards. Um, and what you're finding is a lot of equity firms, people that know nothing about medicine. They just see a group of doctors as somebody, as something to make money off of. And they're buying up doctor groups and running it. That is a big problem in our society. That that private that private holder of our medicine. Uh, if if we have the time after speaking to everybody, we'll talk about that. And if not, check it out at uh, we can uh, it'll be at politicsandright.com/newsletter. But also, I've covered in video many of what the privatized healthcare system means to the average American. It's pretty much death. Let's go on, Joni. Come on in line number two. I uh, just wanted to address the uh, the millennials being able to, you know, help run things now since they're going to be the future. Um, they they have um, made it to where the secret ser uh, that's not secret. I'm sorry, selective service. They just created a, a law, pushed through a law. Um, where you're automatically enrolled in selective service. Um, that was back in June. And I can't remember the name of the law. I don't have it in front of me. But um, and then I'm going to tie that to the, the the fundamentalist Christian types, which is like fundamentalism anywhere where they just go by the letter and forget the spirit of any um, tradition. The, the um, fundamentalist, the Christian right, wants to push um, 
uh, World War. It's it's been documented. I grew up in that church. There there's going to be a battle. They said there's going to be a battle between good and evil, and they're going to happen, and it's going to happen in the Valley of Armageddon. And uh, yes. they want that to happen. They're trying to pull that there, and and that's not pro life. That is pro death. And um and if someone is truly a, a person of their religion, they try to reach higher and promote all life so that we can live for generations and think generations ahead. But that that ilk, that mindset is trying to create a situation, basically trying to what, what they would call tempt God into coming Jesus into coming back because Jesus is not going to let, you know, his his people go through suffering. So they want to go ahead and create world war so that Jesus will hurry up and come back and take them up. It's crazy. It's, Not it's, revelation. I, it's a I, revelation I doctrine. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So anyway, I just wanted to tie those two things together. So they're trying to, you know, create a situation where they're going to, there's going to be a world war and then also force young people, the young people to go and fight this war and die in it. So just wanted to, to throw that out there and enjoy your day. And thank you for what you do again. Thank you so kindly, Joni. All right, let's go to Raymond. Come on in, Raymond. Good morning, Alberto. Thank you for taking my call. Um, I wanted to speak to uh, the last caller. I think her name was Tony and one from earlier, Ray. I caught about the second half of what he was saying. Uh, and I want to speak to that from the perspective of a lifetime Christian. So, um, Tony, I heard you say that Christians want world war and that couldn't be farther from my experience with many different types of christian churches we pray for peace on a very regular basis and try to do things and support organizations that promote peace so i think that's just um some a false premise or information maybe there are some sects of churches that have some different orthodox but um that's not the general consensus before uh, before you go to your second and, point raymond before you go to your second point i just want to put some defense in for joni because i uh she calls in and i, I know where her heart is uh but she's right about a sect and you uh, you yourself said maybe a sect of christianity she's talking about a particular sect of christianity it happens to be also the ones that aligned with donald trump that what she said is actually been preached in churches and it is the revelations doctrine that they're out there preaching. And, and, and it's one of the reasons they talk about bringing Netanyahu into Congress as somebody who is trying his utter best with not negotiation for solutions, but tempting to bring that war into the Middle East. So there's a whole lot of merit to what she said there. And it's not about you, who is a good Christian, who is living by the tenets of Jesus Christ. It is about those people that are warped. Continue, please, my brother. Okay. So so the book of Revelations is a prophetic book that talks about the end times and Armageddon and a lot of things that are going to occur. Just because that's what Christians believe is going to occur in the future doesn't mean that that's what the majority of Christians are praying for and hoping for. Agreed. So I, I agreed. Think you quite, quite well. Agreed. Um, agreed. And, and the, to, to the other point, uh, Ray was talking about uh churches that don't that shouldn't let in people who are convicted felons well there's a lot of different churches and they all have their own kind of guidelines and rules and what they accept and what they don't and and some of them I agree with and some of them I don't I've moved around to a lot of different churches but I have found one and I want to encourage people that are there are churches out there that will accept everyone for who they are regardless of their past and I believe and my church supports that that is the right way because the the church should be open to helping everyone and i see the families and the people that come in and once they get exposed to and, and immersed to the word of god and they take it into heart they have life-changing experiences for the better and i know you you've seen this and you agree with this because i've heard you talk to it before even though you're not necessarily religious you see the benefits of the church in the community and i've seen that many many times with many many people and families and I'd like to encourage people, regardless of your past, don't be scared to try to reach out to a church for support. Raymond, let me let me just interrupt you again, because Ray also is a frequent caller and someone I know. And he believes exactly what you said. The church is open to everybody. He was saying this in the context of Donald Trump taking over a church. Donald Trump isn't a changed person trying for redemption. 
And that's what he's talking about. And you know the tenets of redemption. And just as a qualifier, my wife is a deacon in a church and uh, St. Luke, I mean, uh, the Luke which is in Humble, Texas, one of the largest churches out here, uh, is a great church doing great work in the community. And the pastor, Dr. Sloan, who I'm close with, love because of what he's doing in the community. So in as much as I'm not a religious person, I'm actually a humanist, I really respect the work of good Christians. And there are uh, good Christians out there, but there are also dangerous Christians out there. Just thought I might make that comment. Thank you, Bremen. Anything else, Raymond? Well, I, I, I can appreciate that. And since you give me the last word, I appreciate that, too. Um, I will say you made a comment during this phone call with me that the Christian churches who support Donald Trump are um, of a different character and with a negative connotation. And I'm going to say I, I don't think the church necessarily has to support a Democrat or a Republican or a, a candidate, a specific candidate, or even a specific party. I think they support our Christian principles, the principles that Jesus Christ taught in the Bible and the apostles promoted in the, in the beginning of the church. And whichever party supports those principles the best is the one that I see them support. And I've been to different churches that support opposite parties, but I've also seen the parties change their perspectives on different right. things over the years. No, so, no. so I'd like to, I'd like to leave it just a little more open-minded. Raymond, Raymond, what you've done is you've, 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 you've made me give another comment. And Derek, Patrick, and Brian, I'm coming to you. Each of you are going to get a minute. But here, here's the thing, Raymond. This is important. Uh, Trump is special. OK, Trump is not any other presidential candidate. I don't care if you support Republicans or Democrats, churches, that is right. But when you support a person so antithetical to what Christianity is, as is Donald Trump, as explained, as as Howard explained, how do you tell your daughter, your son, X, Y and Z? At that point, that church loses credibility. So why? While I can I agreed with you on all the other issues. I will tell you that any pastor of any church that supports Donald Trump and tries to direct his pew to that, I will go out on a limb and say that is a false prophet. Continue, my brother, and then we need to run to Derek. Well, I'm going to have to disagree with you on that point. And that's fine. That's fine. We can dis- We can agree to disagree, my brother, you know, but I. Th- that's my thought. I, that, I that, thank you, sir. I really appreciate your call. OK, we had a lot to talk about. Thank you. All right, let's go to uh, let's go to brother Derek. Hey, good morning, Alberto. Uh, Alberto, what you saying? Said just said is true. What I have found, Alberto, if you ask any pastor of Christianity or any pastor, even in Islam, a lot of folks do not know. But if you ask them where is America styled in the Bible, quite a bit of them can't even tell you. You know why they don't? They can't tell you because it's not written out the United States. But the United States is styled in the Bible in symbol. And it, like one, for example, where where the holy is 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 um, committing fornication through all other nations. But what other female uh, statue do you know of? But the but the but the uh, the Statue of Liberty and 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 where it talks about committing fornication throughout all of the other nations. Who else but the United States that has goes into every nation that tries to bring in all their people? And then the United States is also styled as the, an, an eagle. You got to look into the symbolization and you will find the truth. But as long as you try to put a doctrine on it by somebody else's standards, just like you just told me about how you going to pull in Donald Trump to become the central figure, what happened to Jesus? That's Amen. I'm say, bro. Thank you. I appreciate your uh, thoughts, Derek. You have a wonderful rest of your day. All right, let's go to Patrick. Hey, good morning. Um, I sent you uh, three videos on private equity a couple months ago and then resent it with the attention to Jack. Uh, I encourage you to, to try and find uh, time on your program to talk about it. One of one of four emergency rooms in the United States are owned by private equity, which means you oh. can go to a memorial. And I'm not saying that they are, but you can go to Memorial Hermann and go in the emergency room, and it's a completely different business than the rest yes. of the hospital. And what they did, what they did with that business model is emergency rooms used to be run as a democracy amongst uh, right. a group of doctors. 
they they go in and they fire all those doctors and then they tell them that they can have their job back as long as they run the business the way the private equity firm runs it. Uh, emergency room visits, the, the, the wait time sometimes doubles and triples after these changes. Um, the doctors have, have fewer benefits, so longer hours, they're more tired. The uh, private equity is also taking over uh, elder care. Elder care in the United States is absolutely broken. These oh, people yeah. are uh, fleeing. Patrick, Patrick, I'm running out of time. You nailed it. Now, let me tell you, I cover a lot of this on my three o'clock show where we go a bit longer sometimes on these issues with the private equity firms and the privatized healthcare system. Why it is non-functional. Uh, thank you for bringing that up. Uh, do me a favor because I get a ton of mail, including a ton of mail from all of you guys, which I love, and I try to answer them all. But that may have slipped me. The 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 uh, I I have a thing that from Patrick that I kind of aggregate. I don't get to look at all of them all at the time. But send me again just so I can make sure that I have it. Put it all in one email and put attention. This is what we spoke about today. All right. Thank you, brother. Yes, sir. Have a great day. I appreciate it. You too now. Uh, let's go to Tall Boss. Come on in, Tall Boss. Uh, you got a minute. Yes, sir. Greetings, my brother. Peace and love. Yeah, man. Peace and love, my brother. Yes, Peace and love. Uh, my Caribbean brother. Hear the accent. Yeah, man. You don't know. You don't know. Yeah. I just wanted to touch on people talking about Sylvester and talk about career politician. I agree with this whole career politician. We need new blood. But Sylvester at this time is the right guy for the job. Sylvester has proven himself over time that he loved this, he loved Houston and he loved his, his state. I see Sylvester, I came to Houston in 2010. When I came to Houston, I was born in Kingston, Jamaica. Mm -hmm. This city is worse than a third world country, man. <laughs> it's about sewage so so everywhere. Sewage so is going everywhere. You know, I'm talking on the southwest side because I live in Cady, so I don't really deal with mm -hmm. that. But I'm saying, you know, and all, in, in other places, I've never seen it, and I've been living in America for 32 years. Houston mm -hmm. is one of the worst cities I'm living. I would call myself on the, the energy capital, but where is that? Bad yeah, roads look, and all. You I mean, you, I, make money, man. You said need to build the city. The telephone and the light poles are falling over. We brother, let me, tell, it, let me tell you something. Light let me tell you something. Over, and these guys making millions of dollars. Excuse me, please. It's him as it worse. It's much the same. These rich guys just take the money and run like they did well, when they went to my country and colonized it. Right. Let me t let me just say something about Houston. Houston is a is a, is made up of a whole bunch of sections, right? And you can know where the money flows in Houston, and you can know where the money doesn't flow in Houston. There are some people that you see what you just said about how bad Houston is. These are people that never went to Studio Wood. These are people that never went to South Park. These are people that never went to these different parts of Houston. That actually, you're coming from Kingston. I've been to Kingston. You're coming from the, uh, the, the, you know what we call the third world. We have good comparative analysis that we can do on this. And I understand exactly what you're saying. The problem is your reality isn't the reality of a lot of other Houstonians, right? Because of how we are carpent, carpent, compartmentalized. But you know what? Uh, that is why I say we need young blood. Because old blood is of what we think we can do. New blood says this is what we're going to do. I like Sylvester. I know Sylvester. I talk to Sylvester. But again, I want young people who have other ideas on how to build the system. And look, I, like I said, that is not a negative talk of, at all. It's just a matter of saying, let's move forward. Hey, brother, tall boss, give me a quick close. I got to go to Brian. Yes, sir, brother. I will give him thanks and praises and rise up, people. Make sure you go out and vote for Democrats. We need it. <laughs> Mr. Peter Watt. Uh, all right, man. I'm going to give you a, uh, hey, hey, I'm going to give you a little bit of my toi. Lord, man, thank you. Give me a call. You have a good one. All right. Yes, my brother. Peace and love. <laughs> All right. Peace. Okay, my dear brother Brian, come on in. Okay. I have two points, uh, two quick points. Uh, Kamala Harris cast a tying vote for the uh, Build Back Better uh, program, right? Yes, sir. And in sir. that program, authorized the IRS to tax people on wages. That yes. Were, uh, I, oh, no, it's a 600. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. And now she's taking credit for wanting to not tax the people in the service industry. Right. So if that's not hypocritical, I don't know what is. Oh, no. Now, I, actually, I think, you, I think you misunderstood the bill. The bill actually in Build Back Better was, uh, was an accounting thing to prevent people, including the, the mega rich from hiding money. So everything was supposed to be accounted for. Some people don't like that level of scrutiny. Some do. All right. I am, and I am, you know, I, I, I really don't care because I pay my taxes. I pay what it's due. Okay. I believe in paying taxes. Okay. I believe in paying taxes. Okay. 
Now, that that said, there's nothing hypocritical about it. Again, uh, yesterday I explained how her policy about no tax on uh, on uh, tips work differently than Trump. So that's where we're at. But anyway, Brian, what else? Real quick, because I got to go back to Howard. Uh, yeah. OK, now, Elon Musk and Trump. And you're dead wrong about the, the taxation, too. You're absolutely dead wrong. I'll go into more of that later. Elon Musk and Trump wanted to have a open discussion, open air discussion. 110 million people wanted to get into it and get involved in it. Somebody didn't, and they hacked them. Okay, now, that's, was, I am a computer guy. That was the biggest lie out there about being hacked. Uh, that was a lie. That was a lie. I'm just telling you, that was a lie. Okay, Are they just screwed up. Think? No, I, I, I got to go. Okay, 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 Brian, okay, Brian, finish. Brian, finish. I'm sorry. Hey, Brian, no, finish. Brian, finish. Oh, God, Lord. Anyhow. Okay. Uh, let, let me, let me, before you go, um, is, is Brian correct that I always cut him off at the end? No, you don't always cut him off. Sometimes he just gets mad and hangs up. Okay, because I want to make sure that it's not, you know, it's not implicit bias or something like that okay go ahead well the thing is the thing is he calls so late in the show that you're yeah. just about running out of time and you okay. are out of time actually i am go ahead give me give me your thought my brother uh, that's it for me have a good day egberto uh, jack right. you got anything well, get your documents out and get out there and vote yep Ab vote. absolutely so my brothers and sisters anyway folks recently chuck todd gave a an analysis after the eau claire uh, uh speech that that uh, uh, Kamala gave as along with Tim Walls, he gave a, an assessment that was somewhat correct. But again, I fail to understand why it is that these mainstream media personalities think they need to give Donald Trump more kudos than they do. I find it amazing. First of all, I want you to listen to Chuck Todd's analysis of where the race is. Chuck, uh, Harris clearly has the wind in her sails. You, you see it in the polling. We see it in the mm -hmm. fundraising. You see the enthusiasm at the rallies. But the basic question, I think, is, is she winning right now or is Trump losing? Well, I think what she's done is she got the Democratic coalition back together. And we, when you start to see there's a new poll out um, that just came over from Marquette University in Wisconsin that sort of helps reinforce what I think we've been seeing, which is Democratic enthusiasm levels about this election now match Republican enthusiasm levels. But here's what hasn't happened. It's not as if Republicans are demoralized about this election, right? When we see, you know, the reason we saw Trump building a lead and why there was such fear among Democrats that Biden was going to lead them into a 1980-like result, a la Jimmy Carter, was because Democratic enthusiasm about the ticket was in the toilet. It was in, and Republicans were much more enthusiastic than Democrats about the election, about voting, all these little measurements that do matter when it comes to gauging turnout. So she's caught up. And I think the question now is, you know, it's sort of like this is still in theory uh, uh, Trump's election to lose. If you look at sort of the fundamentals, right, perception of the economy uh, being really the number one indicator. And there's all these different ways where you could say, OK, and the fact that a majority of the country um, believes we need to go in a different direction. And yet he's handled this moment terribly. He clearly is rattled by this. I've talked to people close to him who indicate, you know, He's had such a one track mind on avenging his defeat um, from Biden that it's bothered him that he's suddenly no longer running against Biden. We saw it. And, you know, it's sort of I wrote that. And then that social post came out last night after I wrote it. It's like, my gosh, it's exactly what these folks were telling me. He can't give up the ghost of Biden right now. And it's because he can't accept that somebody defeated him because they had the opposite personality. And in, in order to accept the Biden defeat, he has to accept the fact that he was rejected and he's still struggling with that. And until they get focused here, um, I think the entire Republican Party's got a problem if the leader of their ticket can't seem to focus on the November election and the opponent he actually has. And you do see a discipline, right, on the on the Democratic side. And let's not, I mean, look, much of the campaign team is still in place from Joe mm -hmm. Biden, but this is a, a campaign that had to do a big shift very quickly. It's yeah. only been a, a couple of weeks, right? You know, Chris, think about it in our own jobs, right? In, there's a, when you have a quick deadline, 
um, and you have to scramble to do something. There's sort of a purpose, and everybody is almost sometimes running uh, uh, running smoother, and people are making quick decisions, and there's you know there's no hemming and hawing and hand wringing which sometimes can bog the decision-making process down. I think certainly the vice president is benefiting from this short timeline. They almost have to be disciplined or they wouldn't be able to make sure they got their ticket in place to make sure they make all the ballots, right? So it's the, the short timeline is forcing discipline and the more disciplined campaigns usually win. Um, Trump has been an unusual per, uh, person in that he's been undisciplined and still been able to pull off victories in the past. But I think that's a unique aspect to him that the rest of history would show you that that doesn't work that way. Now, here's a problem. I want to start with how he ended. He ended with the most disciplined campaigns normally win. I think what he really means is the most or what he should mean is that the most competent uh, campaigns with the most competent person should win. Then the other thing that he said at the end to close it out is that somehow Trump is some different animal where he doesn't have to follow the rules of being competent. He doesn't have to follow the rules about being smart, etc. As if Donald Trump ever won an election at, at some point in time. We need these journalists to come out there and say, if not for a, an aberration in the Constitution that favors landowners, meaning big, big territories that are red, Donald Trump does not have the popular support of the people, and as such, the only reason he became president is because of uh, uh, that electoral college that we have that is a very undemocratic feature within our elections. In other words, going out there and giving uh, the president some sort of kudos for winning something that he didn't really win isn't the answer. Yes, he was a president. Yes, he was a legitimate president. Yes, he was a constitutional president. But let's not make it that he did something that was that superseded what the what let's say back then Hillary Clinton did, what Biden did, what any other president uh, did at all. Because again, Donald Trump can only win an election based on an undemocratic interference, both from the Constitution, from the judges, etc. It was the same thing with, with uh, Bush back in 2000. He could only win an election if he was appointed by the Supreme Court. Statement of fact. Now, yes, because of some interesting features, he, he slightly got the popular vote in 2004. There are some, there's a whole lot of things, swift voting, etc., that, that was causal. But again, remember, Republicans don't win popular vote because their policies are not popular. Let's make that clear. Republicans have only won the popular vote once. In, uh, 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 in fact, I don't think they've, they've, they've won it once in this century. I repeat, Republicans have only won the popular vote once in this century. Uh, my name is Egberto Willis. This is Politics and Right, and you guys know how I end this. Baby, I am what? Out. Support for this show, Politics and Right, comes from politicsandright.com, publishers of how to Make America Utopia, Take Away the Economy from Those Who Rigged It, As I See It, Class Warfare, The Only Resort to Right-Wing Doom, It's Worth It, How to Talk to Your Right-Wing Relatives, Friends, and Neighbors, and other books written by Egberto Willis. 